Uh, good evening or good afternoon or good morning, ladies and gentlemen, depending on which uh, time zone uh, you're actually watching this from. And, and thank you for, for uh, joining in. For those of you who don't know me, which is all of you, uh, my name is Gordon Corrigan. I spent most of my life uh, in the British Army, uh, but the Army is a young man's game and they chuck you out when you're actually quite young. And if you've um, been in an all boys boarding school from the age of 11, and straight into the army and you find yourself uh, in civilian life in your mid 50s it's a bit like being a pit pony dragged up from the stygian darkness and learning all sorts of things you didn't know like bloody and politician are two separate words um, and i thought well what do i know that uh, will earn me a modest stipend and there are really only two things i thought i knew enough about and one was horses and the other was history now the trouble with working with horses is you go bust you go bust in style, leaving a trail of empty champagne bottles and unpaid bills behind you, but you go bust. Uh, so I thought history would be a better bet. And clearly I wouldn't be talking to you tonight if that um, hadn't worked. I won't bore you with the title of all my books because you'll all have bought at least two copies in hardback, one for yourself, one for friend. Um, they're all published in the United States about a year after the UK. And the reason for that is that the publishers insist on changing the spelling. Now, I would have thought that C-E-N-T-R-E and C-E-N-T-E-R are obviously the same word, but the publishers obviously don't, don't think that. Um, and I'm delighted to say that I'm a regular lecturer on, on Golden Eagle, which is, which is super. Now, of course, I'm not, unfortunately, um, standing in the lovely Golden Eagle at the moment, passing through some of the most fascinating areas on this earth. I'm actually in, in lockdown in my study uh, in Kent. But as the great Duke said, we must take the world as it is and not as we might wish to find it. And I'd like to talk to you tonight for my first lecture on the, the Romanovs. Uh, there were 18 Romanovs. Uh, four of them were women. Five of them were murdered. Nine of them married Germans. One was a German. They were appointed by God and responsible only to God. And they ruled Russia for 300 years. When the first Romanov came to the throne in, now we're having a slight technical problem here uh, for some reason. Um, I shall go on talking until we've sorted it out. I should be, we should be having another, um, another uh, slide coming up, but for some reason we don't appear to. Sorry about this. Ah, here we go. Um, now, when the first Romanov came to the throne in 1613, Russia was simply this area that's green and yellow. The green was the Grand Principality of Moscow, and the yellow is the area of territory acquired by Ivan the Terrible, and we'll come to him uh, in a moment. It was 144,000 square miles when the first Romanov came to the throne, uh, and when the last Romanov was killed in 1918, uh, Russia was the whole of this this colored area, eight and a half million square miles, which is more than China and the United States uh, joined together. We don't know what the population was when the first Romanov came to the throne, but in the first census, which was carried out by Peter the Great in 1725, the population was 11 and a half million. By the time the last Romanov was killed in 1918, the population uh, was 166 million. It's now actually 143 million, slightly less, uh, and only 78% of the population are actually uh, ethnic Russians. Um, Ivan, the, Ivan the fourth, Ivan the Terrible, he's a chap up there on the top left of your slide. He was the first ruler of Russia to use the term Tsar, to call himself Tsar, which of course is the same word as Kaiser or, or Caesar. Um, it's a slight mistranslation because he was Ivan Grozny. Now Grozny in Russian really is formidable, powerful, rather than terrible, but terrible is the sobriquet that's, that's come down to us. Um, in his time, the Grand Principality of Moscow became the Russian state. Um, Ivan himself died, he wasn't a Romanov, he died in 1584. He left one incompetent son and the regent was the chap up on the right, Boris Godunov. Um, and Boris Godunov eventually made himself uh, czar. And then he died in 1605. 
And this is this is coincides with the period that in Russian history is known as the time of troubles. It was a period of about 20 years, a period of anarchy, a period of chaos, uh, when uh, Russia was under threat from the Poles and the Lithuanians who, who occupied Moscow at, at one stage. Uh, they were under attack from the Tatars from the east. Uh, religion was under threat. The Russian Orthodox Church was under threat from Roman Catholicism. There were a whole line of usurpers and, and chancers and, and, and dubious people, um, imposters, until eventually the boyars, that's, that's the great men of Russia, the big landowners, the magnates, they decided they had to find someone that they could unite around and someone who could save Russia. And that man was Michael Romanov, who was the chap um, in, in the middle of your slide, Michael the first. Now the reason they found him was that he was distantly related to Ivan the Terrible. So that gave him some uh, legitimacy. Uh, also, he was only 18 and the boyers therefore thought that they could manipulate him, that he would be pliable. But actually he wasn't. Michael Romanov was very much his own man. He did save uh, Russia. He drove back the Poles. He saved the church, the Roman Orthodox Church, from Roman Catholicism. He stopped the raids by the Tatars uh, from the east, and he started to expand uh, towards the Pacific. And they reached the Pacific in 1639. Uh, of course, the, the Russian Far East and Siberia wasn't populated, but they'd actually got to the, got to the Pacific. He died in 1645. Um, aged only 49. The Romanovs tend to, tend to die uh, quite young. Uh, I'm going to have a quick look at the, um, the family tree. Now you don't have to remember this, there's no exam at the end of this, but um, it, it tends to be quite complicated. Michael I, the chap we've been talking about, he's up there, he dies, um, he marries twice, um, sorry, he marries once and he has a son, Alexis, who takes over from him. Alexis marries twice, and Alexa's first wife on the left, Mariah, um, has a son called Fyodor, and Fyodor has a son called Ivan. And over on the other side, by Alexis's second wife, Natalia, uh, he also has a child uh, called Peter, and we'll come back to him. Uh, the Alexis, who's the son of Michael, he came to the throne age 16, so he was very young. Um, but he managed to, to stay on the throne. He had problems with the currency because the Russians wanted to, or he wanted to introduce a copper currency as opposed to gold or silver. Uh, the people didn't like that, they were very suspicious about um, copper currency and there was what are known as the copper currency riots, but they were, they were sorted out. Uh, he died in 1676, again, he was only 47. Uh, and he had a son on the right there, Fyodor, Fyodor was only 15 when his father died, and Fyodor was disabled. Now, we don't know whether he was mentally disabled or, or physically disabled. We simply uh, don't know. Um, he got into trouble with the, with the British or with the English because he dismissed the British ambassador, the poor old British ambassador, when addressing the, the Tsar, Fyodor, um, missed out two of his titles. And uh, at that, the Tsar decided that he would be dismissed, which uh, made um, Charles II very unhappy, who was the king of... England at the time. Um, Fyodor died in 1682. Uh, again, he was only 21. Uh, and he had um, the, uh, the brother, Ivan, that we, we mentioned on the left. Now, Ivan was feeble-minded, but on the principle of primogenitor, then Ivan should be the next Tsar. If we just go back to the, um, to the family tree, there's Alexis, marries twice, Fyodor, and Ivan. Um, and so Ivan really should now be, be the Tsar. Um, but that was not what the boyers wanted. Uh, they thought Ivan, uh, who was about uh, 16, was incompetent, wasn't able to rule the country, and they didn't want him. What they wanted uh, was Peter, who was the son of Alexis' second wife. Peter was only 10. Um, to avoid civil war, and it very nearly came to civil war with the proponents of Ivan and the proponents of Peter, the compromise was that the two, Ivan and Peter, would be co-Tsars, so they would rule jointly. Um, and the regent, until they became of age, because both were, were underage, uh, would be Ivan's sister, so she'd be, she'd be, the, she'd be the regent. Well, that lasted uh, only for seven years, and in 1689, 
uh, which incidentally, putting it in context, was the time of the so-called glorious revolution in England. Uh, there was a coup and the regent, the sister, was dispatched off to a nunnery and Ivan was retired and uh, Peter uh, was now the sole czar. Um, he was um, highly intelligent. He was a huge chap. He was reckoned to be six feet seven tall. Now, when we eventually get to Moscow uh, in the wonderful Golden Eagle, we'll be going to see uh, one of the museums in the Kremlin and you'll see a pair of Ivan's boots. And they're the biggest boots you've ever seen in your life. I mean, he was a huge, a huge chap. I reckon to be six foot seven. He may well have been a bit more than that. He was only 17 at this point. Um, very interested in matters military, trained as a soldier, um, had a lot of success as a soldier, particularly against the Turks, uh, the Ottoman Turks who'd become uh, Russia's traditional enemy, if you like, and that's something that, that carries on throughout uh, Russian history. Um, he also visited England. Um, he was only 25 then, and he looked at uh, how the English cast cannon. The English were the experts at, at casting cannon. Uh, they produced better cannon than anybody else, and he learned from there. Then he went to the Netherlands, and he learned all about uh, shipbuilding. And when he got back uh, to Russia, he started a wholesale modernization, modernization of the government, of the admin, of the army, and of the navy. And he got involved in the Great Northern War. Now, the Great Northern War uh, went on for 20 years, 1700 to 1721. And it was a war between a Russian coalition and a Swedish coalition. Now, we tend to think of the Swedes as rather straight-laced, very peaceful, um, highest rate of alcoholism in Europe. Uh, but we don't think of them as being militaristic. But in the 17th century, um, they were a very formidable military power. Uh, Gustavus Adolphus, the great Swedish soldier whose armies marched all over Europe, uh, he was dead, but his tradition uh, lived on. But the critical battle of this war was the Battle of Poltava, um, where Peter managed to concentrate 42,000 Russians and 86 guns against the Swedish army, which was only 16 and a half thousand and only had two guns. So the result was never in doubt. And although the war trickled on for a few more years, uh, that was it. Poltava was, the, was the, the critical battle, the crucial battle, uh, and Russia had won the war, and Russia got to the Baltic. Now, this had been, again, a long-time Russian aim. If you could get to the Baltic, that gave you an, uh, a, a, an exit. Uh, it gave you access to Europe. You could trade directly with Europe as opposed to everything having to come across uh, over land. Uh, and he ordered the building of St. Petersburg. Um, it was said that it cost the lives of 100,000 uh, Russian laborers. It took them 10 years to build. Uh, the land was marshy, so it was all, everything was built on piles, and there was a whole network of, of canals to, to drain away uh, the water. Uh, he moved his capital to St. Petersburg, and he was proclaimed emperor. So he's the first czar to be czar and emperor, imperator. Um, and from now on, uh, czars would be buried uh, in, in St. Petersburg, as opposed to Moscow. Peter called it his window on the world. It cost a huge amount, of course, and he raised the money by taxing vodka. Um, he, he standardized vodka as 48% of alcohol to volume, and he taxed it. And he also taxed beards, uh, of all things. Now, part of his taxing of beards was a, an aim of trying to turn Russia away from being a, an Asiatic state into being a European country. And this was a period when everybody in Asia wore beards if they could grow them, and people in Europe by and large were clean shaven. So, so that was what, what that was about. And by taxing vodka and taxing beards, uh, he managed to, uh, to build his, his wonderful capital of, of St. Petersburg. Um, he also uh, introduced, well, that he created the law of succession. Now, the law of succession said that it was up to the Tsar to nominate his successor. So he wanted to avoid this business of various bits of the families arguing as to who should actually be the Tsar. So the, the outgoing Tsar, the Tsar before he died, would nominate his successor. But, said Peter, he must be worthy. In other words, he must be a man capable of ruling the country. So that would rule out the mad, uh, the incompetent, uh, or, or the child. And, and that, 
law uh, carried on uh, all the way down through the the, um, the Romanov dynasties. Um, just looking, I'm sorry to keep showing these family trees, but as I said, it was complicated. Um, and you've got uh, you've got Peter up here, and he marries twice. Uh, left hand wife um, Evdokia, right hand wife uh, Marfa, who actually changed her name to to Catherine. And the order of succession is Peter dies, his wife Catherine uh, takes over, she rules the country. That then switches uh, over to the son of, um, or the grandson rather, uh, Peter's grandson. Uh, uh, and then it moves across to the daughter of Ivan. Now Ivan was the simple-minded Kozar that was removed. Uh, then it all goes on down to a grandson who's another Ivan, and then it switches across to Elizabeth, who's the daughter of um, Peter's second wife, uh, then across to, um, to Peter III over here, uh, who marries uh, somebody called Catherine, uh, and, that, uh, and she's, she's an exile. Now, I, I told you it was, it was complicated. Um, the, um, the, there's a palace coup after Peter dies. Um, it's a pretty minor coup. It's put down pretty quickly. Uh, Peter had said that his wife, Catherine, his second wife, he'd sent his first wife off to a nunnery, uh, should, um, should rule the country. She has come into a lot of bad press then at the time. She was said to be illiterate. She was said to be a stupid Lithuanian peasant woman. Uh, she was said to have been a concubine of one of the boyars who'd handed her over to, to Peter. Um, this is probably all untrue. She did uh, rule the country uh, perfectly um, competently. Um, she clearly wasn't uh, illiterate. Uh, she was actually properly married uh, to Peter. They had 10 children between them. Uh, they, he had two sons, one son by Catherine. She died, uh, Piotr, she died, he died uh, very young. And um, another son uh, by, uh, by his first wife uh, called uh, Alexis. Now the son by his first wife, his second, Peter died young, so he's out of it dies as a child. Um, the son by the first wife fell out with his father in a big way, uh, disagreed with his father's policies, uh, wouldn't do what his father wanted him to do. And Peter, Peter the Great had him arrested, had him tortured, had him executed, his own son. So Peter, a great man without any question at all, uh, but he had this cruel streak to him as well. And perhaps to rule a country like Russia then, in the 1700s, perhaps you, you had to have that, uh, that streak of, of cruelty. Um, so we've got uh, Catherine I on, on the left, um, and she wasn't the laundress to the Tsar, she was a perfectly respectable lady. Uh, she ruled for two years and she died in 1727. She was, uh, she was age 41. And again, people said that she either died of tuberculosis or died of drink. Tuberculosis, I think, is a much more likely one. And then Peter II, who's the chap on the top right up there, son of Peter the Great's executed son, Alexei, uh, who's, the, comes, who's, who's out of Peter's first wife. Uh, he's only 12 um, and uh, he dies of smallpox, uh, age 15. That's the end of the direct male line of the Romanovs. Uh, and the throne then passes to Anna, who is a daughter of Ivan, that's, that's uh, Peter's uh, co-Tsar, um, and she dies in 1740, uh, aged uh, 47. Then we move over to Ivan VI, um, grandson of Anna's sister, great grand half-nephew of Peter the Great, I calculate. Well, he was only a year old, uh, and his mother um, is the regent, uh, that lasts for a year, 1741. There's a coup um, led by the commanding officers of the Guards Regiments in St. Petersburg. Uh, poor little Ivan is removed and, and jailed, um, and, and the mother is, is uh, sent off to a nunnery. Um, they kept young Ivan in jail for 20 years. And 20 years later, there was another coup which attempted to rescue him, and he was actually killed uh, during, the, during the rescue attempt. Um, so he's out of it and the throne now passes uh, to Elizabeth 
who was an illegitimate daughter of Peter the Great, out of Catherine. Catherine was the second wife. Um, illegitimately didn't seem to matter terribly in, in those days uh, because she again ruled perfectly competently. Um, there was a, another war with Sweden, which Russia won. There was a Seven Years' War, which I've always maintained as the First World War, in that there was fighting all over the world, fighting in the Americas, fighting in Europe, fighting in Asia. Um, and Russia obtained more territory during, during that war. She was on the, on the winning side. Uh, she persecuted the old believers. Now, the old believers, um, they were really the Russian Orthodox um, equivalent of the Reformation, if you like. Um, the, the argument was that um, the, the patriarch of the, of the Roman, uh, Russian Orthodox Church wanted to try and bring some of the books and some of the manuscripts and some of the rituals up to date. He felt that some of them, some of the books who were being read, some of the documents really weren't relevant, that they, they were out of date. And he introduced some, some new documents, new books uh, and new rituals. And there was a section of the church that disagreed. They, they wouldn't go along with it. They wanted to stick with the old ways. They were known as the old believers. And um, Elizabeth banished them, sent them off to Siberia. And when we eventually get to Siberia in the wonderful Golden Eagle, uh, we shall meet them. They're a jolly, they're, they're a jolly lot, actually. They, they produce um, a jolly good lunch. And I'm delighted to say they're very fond of vodka. So, so we shall enjoy our visit with the, with the old believers. Uh, they're still there and they still practice the, the old belief um, and we'll meet uh, one of their, their priests who will explain to us the difference between the old way and, and, the, and the new way and he's quite a jolly chap with a huge great black beard. Uh, she also expelled the Jews. Now the poor old Jews every time something goes wrong the, the Jews get the blame uh, and she uh, expelled the Jews from Moscow actually and St Petersburg not from Russia as a whole uh, but she demolished mosques. There were a number of mosques, of course, because a lot of people living in the Russian territory weren't Russian. They were, they were Tatars. Um, they had been Turks uh, and uh, they obviously got mosques and she'd had those demolished. Um, and she died in 1761, aged 52. Um, so then we, we move on to Peter III. Now, Peter III is the son of Elizabeth's sister. So he's a, he's a great grandson of Peter the Great through the female line. He was born in Germany. Um, his father was, was a German um, and his father died in 1742. So he, aged 14, is brought back to Russia and he has to learn Russian and he has to convert to the Russian Orthodox Church. Um, and at the age of 17, he's married uh, to a German lady uh, Sophie Frederick August of Anhalt Zerps. She's only 16. Um, and she, of course, has to convert to the um, Ro Russian Orthodox Church and changes her name to a Katharina or Catherine. Now, Peter's father, oh, sorry, Peter's father, the previous Tsar, um, Elizabeth, uh, she dies in, in 1761, as she said. So um, he is now the Tsar, uh, aged. 33. So he had quite a long time as the heir to the throne. He was almost certainly uh, retarded, Peter III. Uh, he was certainly thoroughly unpleasant. Um, he bored holes in his aunt's uh, bedroom wall so he could spy on her when she was taking her clothes off to go to bed. Uh, he tortured animals for fun. He would uh, send for horses or, or goats or sheep and torture them just, just for fun. So he's a thoroughly uh, unpleasant uh, fellow. Um, he, did, um, he did carry out some uh, reform or attempted to uh, carry out some reforms of the law, but really never got anywhere. He upset the army uh, by changing the uniforms. Now, the army uniforms have been designed by Peter the Great, who was still the great hero of the Russians. And he changed them to the Prussian style because, of course, he'd been brought up uh, in Prussia. Um, and that wasn't popular. He neglected uh, the Orthodox Church. And um, just before he was due to be crowned, he'd become the Tsar, but he wasn't yet, hadn't yet uh, been crowned. He hadn't had his coronation. Uh, there was a coup, uh, 28th of June, 1762, and he's deposed in favour of his wife before the coronation. Uh, the British got involved in this because the British ambassador, um, Hanbury Williams, was very much involved in, in helping to organise this because the British thought that Catherine would be a better bet <coughs> than... Uh, and Peter. 
Uh, Peter died. Actually, he was murdered. Um, they said that he died of hemorrhoidal colic, whatever that is. I don't know what hemorrhoidal colic is, but it sounds pretty unpleasant. Um, but it's pretty certain that he was actually uh, murdered in, in July 1762. Uh, and that left uh, his wife. Now, she's a German. She's Sophie Frederick August of Anshalt Zerbst. There isn't a drop of Russian blood in her. And she came from rather dour Lutheran Germany, um, where sex is all right as long as you don't enjoy it. And she comes to Russia and she falls in love with Russia, and particularly with the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, with, its, with its insets and its bells and its music and its wonderful icons and its vestments. Um, and uh, and she, she really becomes a full steam ahead uh, Russian. Uh, changed her name, as we've said, to Ekaterina. Um, she was highly educated. That was unusual for, for ladies in those days. So by and large, most aristocratic ladies, uh, they might be taught sort of needlework and embroidery and a bit of music and perhaps a foreign language or two, but that was that. She was very well educated. Uh, she corresponded with Voltaire and, and other philosophers. Uh, and she um, again started on a reform, uh, reform of the law. Uh, she abolished corporal punishment. Uh, for gentry and merchants, not for the peasantry. Um, she, several times during her reign, she moved towards a constitutional monarchy. She, she thought that the British system was, was the best way to do it. Uh, she always stopped short. There were too many vested interests amongst the, amongst the aristocracy and the autocracy uh, to let her do that. Um, she considered abolishing serfdom. Now, serfs weren't quite slaves. Um, but they were very nearly, they did have some rights, uh, but they worked land belonging to the local magnate, the local landlord, uh, in return for services th that they, they had to do for him. And so they had to work, uh, produce crops and, and whatnot for him as well. And the magnate could decide who they got married to and whether they could get married or whether they couldn't. Um, so they were, they were almost slaves, but, but not quite. She considered abolishing it, um, but discovered that it just couldn't be done because too many of the powerful men uh, in the country uh, owned serfs and, and weren't prepared to, to go along with it. There were a number of wars with, with Turkey. Um, the, the main one was, was the Battle of Chesme. The Battle of Chesme um, was during one of the wars with Russia in 1768 uh, when the Russian Baltic fleet sailed out of the Baltic all the way around into the Mediterranean and they managed to corner the whole of the Turkish fleet in, in a place called Chesme Bay which is just off Anatolia in the Aegean and they completely annihilated them between the 5th and the 7th of June 1770 and a painting was done uh, for Catherine. Now of course the painters weren't there and when she saw the painting she said no no that's not good enough you haven't got the idea at all. Um, now we'll blow up a ship so that you can see what a ship blown up looks like and you can paint it. So a Russian warship was packed with explosives, the crew were obviously taken off and was blown up. So the painters painted that um, and that uh, you can see that that's the that's the result. One of the things she did which is very much relative to what's happening today was that she annexed the Khanate of the Crimea in uh, 1783. That had been part of the Ottoman Empire, the Turkish Empire, and she annexed it in 1783 and, and said this is part of Russia. Um, and from then on it has always been Russia. Um, it was put into the Ukraine by Khrushchev in 1953 because if you look at where Ukraine is on the map and where Crimea is on the map then it would make sense <coughs> to have the Crimea uh, administered within the Ukraine. And as the Ukraine was then a Soviet Socialist Republic it didn't really matter very much. What they probably should have done in 1991 when the Soviet Union came to an end was negotiate um, the Crimea going back uh, to Russia. That's, that's something that uh, you know, we can deal with in another, another lecture, but it's just worth remembering that, that Catherine the Great annexed to Russia uh, the Crimea from the Turks um, in, in 1783. Um, and in fact, Crimea then became the basis for the Russian Black Sea Fleet because one of the things she was also doing in these wars against the, the Turks was taking bits of the coast, the northern coast of the Black Sea. Uh, the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, had gone all the way around the Black Sea, except for Georgia, for some reason, wasn't part of it. Uh, but the rest was, and what Russia was doing was more and more taking 
the northern coast uh, of the Black Sea. Um, she also expanded to the west. Um, she took um, a third of, of Poland. Uh, she started moving into the Caucasus. Now that worried the British once Russians start moving into the Caucasus because they're getting a bit near to Afghanistan, they're getting a bit near to, to British India. Uh, and that's the beginning really of what we call uh, the great game. She curbed the powers of the church. Uh, she freed church serfs. She couldn't free, get rid of the serfs altogether, but she got rid of the, she freed the ones blind to the church and church land from now on would be state land. Um, when the French Revolution broke out in 1789, uh, she initially was rather in favor of it. She thought that, you know, there's, there's some good ideas here. Uh, but then she thought that actually chopping the head off uh, anointed monarchs wasn't perhaps a good idea. It wasn't perhaps a terribly good role model. So she turned, uh, she turned against it. She was um, undoubtedly highly sexed. <clears throat> she had a number of lovers, 12 that we know of in the 44 years that, uh, that she was on the throne. And they were all dumped gracefully. Uh, whenever she got rid of one of them, uh, they would be given a couple of titles, given some land, and they all remained friendly. They remained on terribly good terms. Um, I suppose the best known one really was Potemkin. Potemkin is the man who starts to colonize the shores of the Black Sea um, because they've taken this land, they've taken it away from the Turks and they want now to populate it with Russians and, and Potemkin starts to, starts to do that. He himself actually died during a negotiation in, uh, with the Turks in uh, 1791 but he's, uh, he's probably the, the greatest of, of her lovers and he was her Equivalent of, equivalent of Prime Minister. Now she had one son, Catherine had one son by her husband before she had her husband murdered. Uh, the son was called Paul, born in 1754. Um, he was not, in Catherine's view, suitable to be Tsar. Uh, and she had never had any intention of, um, of nominating him as her successor. Uh, she actually wanted to uh, have uh, Paul's son, uh, no, it's her grandson, Alexander, whom she thought was a much more suitable chap. Uh, and she groomed him to be the Tsar. But she died of a stroke in the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg on the 17th of November, 1796. She'd added 9 million square miles to Russia and she doubled the population. But that actually meant that from now on, the Russians were not uh, the majority. In their, in, their, in their own state. In other words, there were more non-Russians than there were uh, Russians. And she died and her will was never found. The will nominating her successor. Now, was it not written? Uh, most unlikely, of course, she would have written a will. She was a very competent administrator. Um, I suspect it was found by Paul's supporters and, and destroyed. Um, and having another quick look at the family tree, uh, there's Catherine the Great, um, and uh, there's, there's uh, Paul uh, and Alexander. Uh, and she didn't want Paul, didn't want Paul to be that chap to be the Tsar. She wanted it to be uh, Alexander, but that uh, that wasn't to be. Um, and uh, Paul became the Tsar. I think if we knew him today, we'd say he was manic depressive. He was certainly a very very odd chap. Um, there's one well-recorded case where he's in his carriage coming uh, out of the palace and there's a wretched soldier standing in the snow, a private soldier who presents arms as he should, and he tells the coachman to stop and he says to the soldier, hop in, sergeant. And as they trot off, he says, now, what do you think, sergeant? And the chap says, I I'm not a sergeant, sir. I I'm, I'm actually a private soldier. Yes, you are. In fact, you're a lieutenant. Now, captain, tell me what you think. Um, and by the time they got back to the palace, this wretched private soldier found himself as a major. And um, when they get back to the palace, uh, the Tsar calls for the commander of the guard and said, this man is now a lieutenant colonel, see to it. So this poor chap who eats his peas with his knife and, and can't read and write and comes from the middle of nowhere, suddenly finds himself in the officer's mess. Um, I don't suppose the officers were delighted to have him, but I'm quite sure he wasn't at all happy. Uh, so he wants to go back to being a private soldier, but he can't, the Tsar has made him a lieutenant colonel. Uh, and this was the sort of thing that, that he would do. He started to undo all his mother's reform. Um, compulsory service for the nobility came back in. Corporal punishment came back in. Rebels against Catherine, who'd been locked up, <coughs> were freed. Um, 
there was a good side to him. Um, he, for example, he started schools for girls. Now, up to that in Russia, there were no schools for girls. Girls weren't educated. Uh, he thought they should be, and he started uh, schools for them. He also started schools uh, for artisans and, and craftsmen, uh, technical colleges, if you like. So all that was, was good stuff. Um, he wasn't quite sure whether he liked Napoleon or not. Um, he kept, he would join one of the British co uh, coalitions against Napoleon, then he'd leave it, and then he'd go back again. Um, eventually, in 1801, he sent off 25,000 Cossacks uh, to take India. Now, if they'd got there, uh, if they had got there, um, they wouldn't, of course, been able to take India because they would have been at the end of a very, very long chain of supply and they'd have run up against the, the British Indian Army, which was, of course, operating from its own bases. And, and, uh, but as it happens, they never got there because on the 11th of March, 1801, there was a coup led by the commanding officers of the Guards regiments, uh, including Paul's ADC, and almost certainly with the approval of his son, Alexander, uh, Paul was removed and murdered. And the Tsar now is Alexander I, who's Catherine the Great's grandson. He's 24 years of age. Uh, he joins the Third Coalition, England's coalition. There were seven coalitions altogether against um, revolutionary and Napoleonic France, all financed uh, by Britain. Uh, but at the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805, uh, he is utterly defeated. The Russian army is completely annihilated by Napoleon. Uh, Alexander actually has to flee. Um, there's another Russian defeat at Friedland in 1807. Uh, so in 1807, he decides he's got to come to terms with Napoleon. And he meets Napoleon near a town called Tilsit. Uh, and they meet on a raft in the river Neyman. And Alexander says to Napoleon, well, the one thing we have in common we both hate the English. The English knew exactly what was happening because there was a British spy clinging onto the edge of the raft in the river, cold, very cold water, listening, listening to everything that was said and reporting back. Uh, one of the things that Russia had to agree to uh, when they signed the Treaty of Tilsit with Napoleon was that they had to join <clears throat> what Napoleon called the Continental System. Now, the Continental System said, um, England is our main enemy, not, not the British Army, that's tiny. It's the Navy, which is blockading us and stopping us doing anything. And it's the fact that England is the richest country in the world and they are financing all these coalitions. If we can knock England out of the war, then the coalitions fall apart and we've won the war. How do we, how do, we do that? Well, we can't invade England because of the Royal Navy, um, but England makes its money by importing raw materials and exporting manufactured goods. And they also import 20% of all the food that they eat. So if we stop everybody from trading with England, firstly, they'll go bust, and secondly, they'll starve. Good idea. It didn't actually work because everybody wanted English manufactured goods and all the smugglers lit a fat cigar. Um, and in Russia particularly, Russia needed English manufactured goods and continued to import them and eventually actually started to tax um, French imports. Uh, and Napoleon got more and more fed up with Alexander and the Russians and eventually decided that enough was enough. Um, and in 1812, he took an army of half a million uh, all the way into Russia. Uh, he fought one battle before he got to Moscow, the Battle of Borodino, 60,000 French dead. The Russians had an awful lot of dead as well, but they could replace their casualties, which the French couldn't. Uh, so Borodino, yes, the French won it, but it was very much a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, they got to Moscow. They assumed that the Tsar would come to the table, but he didn't. The Tsar was advised by Suvorov, his great Russian general, do not fight, we simply withdraw. So they withdrew back into the great hinterland, the huge interior of Russia. They set fire to Moscow and the wooden buildings went up in smoke. They opened the jails, they opened the lunatic asylums. And the French sat there waiting for a Russian with a white flag who never turned up. And in the end, uh, all Napoleon could do was retreat uh, back, back to Paris, back to France. And of the half million men he took into Russia, coming back all the way, this awful retreat through the Russian winter, being harried and sniped at and ambushed by the, the Russians. And all that was left capable of doing their duty at the end of it was 50,000 men. 
Well, of course, by the end of the Napoleonic Wars, which would go on, of course, as we know, until 1814 with another burst in 1815, Alexander is incredibly popular. He's the, he's the hero of the Napoleonic Wars. He's the victor of the Napoleonic Wars. He's the man that chased Napoleon all the way back to Paris. Uh, of course, he didn't, but, but that's what the Russian history books uh, said he did. Uh, and Russia gained a considerable amount of territory uh, from the Napoleonic Wars. They were able to um, annex Georgia, and they were able to annex Finland. Uh, Alexander died suddenly in 1825 at a place called Tagnarok, which is on the Sea of Azov. And again, he's only 47. And because it was a sudden death, he hadn't had time to promulgate uh, who his successor should be. He didn't expect to die at the age of 47. We don't really know what he died of, incidentally. There were all sorts of conspiracy theories that he was poisoned or committed suicide. No reason why he should commit suicide and no reason why he should be poisoned because he was extremely popular. Um, so it's probably the curse of the Romanovs. They, they do tend to, to die young. Now, because he hadn't um, promulgated a successor because of a sudden death, uh, the government assumed that the throne would pass to the next brother, who was Constantine, here on the left. Um, and they announced that the next Tsar was Constantine. The army took an oath of allegiance to Constantine. They started to uh, mint coins with Constantine's head on it. Constantine wasn't there. Constantine was in Poland as the governor general. Um, he was in slightly bad odor with the aristocracy because his first wife had run away. His first wife was German, and he was obviously a difficult chap to live with. Uh, she'd run away and he'd married a Pole and this was not good for him they thought uh, why doesn't he marry a German like everybody else and Constantine didn't want the throne he was perfectly happy with his little Polish wife in Poland and he sent a message back up to St Petersburg saying I do not want the throne I am not in the slightest bit interested so when the news eventually got back to St Petersburg that he didn't want the throne then on the 13th of December uh, the Senate the, the government uh, announced that uh, Nicholas, the next brother down, uh, would be the Tsar. And the following day, 14th of December, uh, there was a revolution. There was, well, it wasn't a revolution, it was a mutiny by some of the regiments, led by young officers. Now these young officers, they'd been in the Napoleonic Wars, they'd seen Europe, and they wanted reform. They wanted reform of the administration, reform of the army, and they thought Constantine was the man to give them that reform. They saw him as a reformer and they thought that there was some nefarious plotting that had excluded him from the succession. Uh, they hadn't realized that actually Constantine had said quite clearly uh, he didn't want uh, the throne. The mutiny went off at half cock, uh, battalions parading, they paraded in the wrong place, the wrong time, the regiment that was supposed to take the winter palace the commanding officer didn't turn up uh, either because he slept in or because he knew something that nobody else did uh, and the mutiny was very quickly put down by troops uh, loyal to, to Nicholas. Uh, they were known, the, the rebels were known as the Decembrists, uh, five of them were hung publicly and the rest, the ones mainly nobility who they felt couldn't really execute, they were exiled to Siberia. And when we eventually get to Siberia, uh, we will be visiting uh, one of their houses uh, and we'll learn about how they lived and, and what they did. I have to say, uh, having seen the house, uh, it was actually quite a comfortable exile. Uh, they lived in quite, uh, quite reasonable conditions uh, and they seem to have uh, no shortage of champansky, the excellent Russian champagne, which incidentally is far better than French champagne and considerably cheaper, but that's, that's another point. Um, so, uh, the, the, the throne now passes to Nicholas I. He's 29, uh, again uh, an autocrat, as they all tended to be. Uh, but he did, again, uh, thought that serfdom really wasn't a good idea, that it really wasn't good for the economy. But again, uh, he said, we can't abolish it yet. What he did want to do was to industrialize Russia. Russia was very much an agricultural country. Something like 98% of the population lived on the land and tilled the land. And he thought, no, industrialization is the way to go. And it was a period when relations between England and Russia had, had warmed up a bit. They, they, they were reasonably quite good. So he paid a visit to England, a state visit um, in 1844. And he met Queen Victoria, who, who liked him. And he was terribly interested in railways. Now he knew that uh, the British had invented railways and were developing railways. Uh, and he thought perhaps railways were the answer to this huge country of his. Uh, 
which had either no roads or, or awful roads. Railways were the answer. So he said he'd like to learn about railways. And he was taken along to Vauxhall. Now Vauxhall uh, was then a major um, London railway station. It's still a London railway station, but not uh, nearly as important as it was. And he was met and, and they welcome uh, your Imperial Majesty, welcome to Vauxhall. This is how the railways work. This is how the timetable works. This is how it's all knitted together. Now, when he went away, either he or his entourage assumed that Vauxhall wasn't the name of a place, it meant a station. So now, today, the Russian for a railway station is Vauxhall. And at each station we stop at, you'll, you'll get out and you'll see Ertusk, Vauxhall, Moskvall, Vauxhall, um, Vladivostok, Vauxhall. So it just shows you how, um, uh, how, how uh, languages uh, develop. Um, by the time he died in 1855, Russia did have 650 miles uh, of railway. Um, the UK at the same time had 7,000 miles, uh, but it was a start. And again, he had successful wars against Persia um, when they, in 1826, when they annexed the eastern bit of Armenia. Another wars against Turkey. Uh, problems in Poland, which they managed to put down. And then, of course, 1848, all these little uh, revolutions all over Europe, most of them put down, many of them put down with, um, with Russian help. Um, but then there was the Crimean War, uh, 1853 to 1856, uh, which is the British, the French and the Turks versus the Russians. Uh, it's called the Crimean War, which is where the main battles were, but there was also fighting in the, um, in, in, in the Baltic, uh, and indeed in the, in the White Sea, in the Barents Sea, way up in the north. Um, it was supposedly all to do with the guardianship of the holy sites um, in the Middle East, in, in, um, in Jerusalem and, and what is now Israel. Uh, the Tsar saw himself as the protector of the Russian Orthodox. The Russian Orthodox Church thought they ought to run the sites. The French saw themselves <clears throat> as the protector of the Roman Catholic Church, and the Roman Catholics thought they should run the sites. The British thought the whole thing was a lot of superstitious nonsense, but they were very concerned that if, the, if Turkey collapsed completely, then the Russians would get Constantinople. And that, again, was a long-term Russian aim. If they could get Constantinople, then they could control entry and exit uh, to the Black Sea, and they'd have exit into the Mediterranean. So that's why the British got involved. Um, the Russians were beaten, um, the, uh, really because they were, they were even more inefficient than the, than the British and the French, and weren't actually terribly competent at that particular time. Uh, but in the Russian army, by then, loyalty to the Tsar, uh, long service, uh, and being good on, on the parade ground took precedence over um, modern weapons and, and military competence and the logistic system uh, didn't work. Uh, so he lost a lot of credibility of course in the country over the Crimean War. He died in 1855 aged 59 so he lived a little bit longer than the average Romanov but again there was conspiracy theories. Uh, you know had he committed suicide because of the result of the Crimean War um, or, or was, he, was he poisoned? Um, and his successor was Alexander II, uh, who came to the throne just at the last bit of the Crimean War, although he avoided the criticism for it. Um, again, married a, married a German, 37 when he comes to the throne, and he's known as the Tsar Liberator. He said, it's better to abolish from above what will eventually abolish itself from below. In other words, uh, free the serfs now before there's a great revolution and they, and they freed themselves. There were 20 million serfs in 1861 when he announced their, their freedom. <clears throat> it sounded good, but of course, um, they, the serfs had no money. Um, a lot of them were heavily in debt. So although they're now free, they can't sort of go anywhere. And most of them stay working for exactly the same magnates under uh, slightly uh, improved conditions. Uh, but it didn't didn't actually make that much difference, um, except that they could no longer, of course, be bought and sold and, and married off and, and, and punished. Um, he relaxed uh, censorship in the country. He allowed passports. In other words, he allowed Russians to travel abroad if they if they wished. Uh, he tried to create an independent judiciary and made some strides towards doing that. And he brought in a trial by jury. On the military side, uh, he made national service, that was compulsory military service by all males, and he brought that down to six years. Now we may think, crikey, compulsory military service for six years. Um, 
but it had been for life. When you were conscripted into the Russian army before that, it was for life. Um, it was until you died or until the army got fed up and, and chucked you out. So bring it down to six years was actually a considerable, considerable reform. Um, he made beards illegal. So unlike Peter the Great who taxed them, uh, Alexander actually made them uh, illegal. But the trouble about reform is that of course it does allow dissent to spread because you haven't got your foot on the, on the, on the neck anymore. Uh, and there were anyway um, tensions within Russia, tensions of the various nationalities, the non-Russian races. Um, there was um, a realization of, of factory workers um, who started wanting to have some say in the running of their own factory. There was a whole plethora of illegal political parties, mainly uh, of the left. There were a number of assassination attempts um, of, of officials, senior officials. There was um, a certain amount of terrorism. And on the 1st of March, 1881, Alexander was coming back from a military parade and a bomb was, was thrown at his carriage um, in St. Petersburg. It damaged his carriage, but not him. He was fine. He got out and wanted to check that his guards were all right and wanted to see the damage. And his staff said, sir, sir, you, you know, we must get out of here. But he said, no, 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 he wants to see what's happening. Um, and another bomb was thrown at blasted his legs, they were shattered. He was rushed to the palace in St. Petersburg and he died that afternoon. And on the 3rd of April, five terrorists who were thought to be involved in it uh, were, were publicly hanged. Well, his son was Alexander III. Um, Alexander's older brother died of tuberculosis in 1865, so, so Alexander becomes the, the Tsar. Uh, he was married to Dagmar of, of Denmark. Now, Dagmar of Denmark was a sister of Queen Alexandra of England, Edward VII's queen. He becomes a czar at the age of 36. He is an uncompromising autocrat. No nonsense about reform, uh, no nonsense about liberalisation. He undid just about all his father's reforms. Uh, he cancelled the, the Senate, <coughs> which was a fairly uh, legless operation, but at least it was something. He reduced, got rid of that, uh, reduced the powers of local authorities, abolished local uh, justices of the peace, brought in press controls, brought in restrictions on universities, abolished all the courses for women, expelled the poor old Jews yet again from Moscow. And he got away with it. He was a very strong personality. He had the character and the ability and the charisma to get away with this. He was also the first czar to have a beard for 200 years, presumably a reaction against his father's uh, making beards illegal. From our point of view, of course, he's important because he began the Trans-Siberian Railway uh, in 1891. Uh, it wasn't finished till 1904, but which time he was dead. Uh, initially, the Trans-Siberian ferried across Lake Baikal. Now, we, when we go, will actually travel around Lake Baikal uh, on a train, uh, but initially it was, it was, um, it was by, by ferry. Um, and we will see several statues, which <clears throat> since the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the number of statues of, of Alexander have been put up along the Trans-Siberian Railway because he's, he's the man who, who thought of it and, and who started it. Um, he had a cautious foreign policy. Uh, he avoided war with the British over um, Afghan and, and the Caucasus. Uh, he avoided war with Austria over the question of Bulgaria. When Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany did not renew what was called the Insurance Treaty uh, with, with Russia, and he didn't renew it in 1890, uh, Alexander thought, right, we're going to suddenly find ourselves without friends. And they then signed an alliance with France, with Republican France. And that, of course, was one of the seeds uh, of the First World War. Uh, he died age 49. Again, the Romanovs die young. It was said unkindly that he, that he died of drink, but he probably simply died by, of natural causes. And his son is Nicholas II. Um, comes to the throne at 26. Uh, unlike his father, he did not have the personality and the charisma and the ability to be an autocrat, although he said he would be. He said that I am going to preserve the principles of autocracy as my father did. He married Alexandra of Hesse, a German, uh, who was a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. They were both intensely religious, uh, Alexandra particularly. She was very much into mysticism. So there were all sorts of dubious people hovering around the, around the throne. Um, they didn't like social life. 
uh, they, they didn't uh, socialize if they could possibly avoid it. Now, if you are a royal person, you have to socialize, whether you like it or not. They didn't. They spent most of their time in the Alexandra, Alexander Palace, which is in Sarkozelo, which is well outside the St. Petersburg. Um, they were rather prudish. Poor old Nijinsky got sacked from the Imperial Theatre Company for wearing a codpiece, which was thought to be uh, far too big and indecent. Uh, of course, again, Russia had uh, the military failure of the Russia-Japanese War in 1904. Um, and a lot of the blame for that, of course, was laid uh, on the Tsar. There were also problems uh, with, uh, again, with the non-Russian subjects, these, these tensions, these nationalist ideas. Uh, there were problems with students, more and more students who were educated and, and wanted reform. Um, there were the peasants who wanted reform of the land laws all sorts of uh, political parties which were illegal but nevertheless existed, uh, factory workers wanting a say uh, in the running of, the, of their own factory. And on the 19th of January 1905, Bloody Sunday as it was called, there was a peaceful demonstration outside the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg um, and the army turned out to put it down and opened fire and a lot of people were, were killed. And this sparked off strikes in the factories uh, there's the famous uh, mutiny of the battleship Potemkin. Now, the battleship Potemkin, they actually mutinied because of the standard of food. Uh, the food the sailors were being given, the meat was rotten and there wasn't enough of it, so they mutinied. But, of course, the, uh, <coughs> the left-wing parties, particularly the Bolsheviks, turned this into a political uh, action. Um, there were mutinies by troops on the Trans-Siberian Railway, again, because they weren't getting uh, sufficient rations, weren't being properly looked after. Uh, he was forced, Nicholas was forced to concede a Duma, concede a parliament in 1906. He managed to dissolve two of them. Uh, the third lasted, but really was, was muted. Um, I said that the Empress was, was surrounded by all sorts of snake oil salesmen and highly dubious mystics. Uh, there were lots, Rasputin wasn't the only one, but he's the one we, we know most about, uh, Rasputin. Um, there's no evidence at all that Rasputin had any influence on Russian domestic or foreign policy or any influence on what the Tsar did. But that didn't matter. People believed he did. People believed that Rasputin worked on the Empress, who in turn worked on the Tsar, and that really Rasputin was running, running the country. Now, that's the bad side, but by 1914, Three-fifths of peasant children were in school. Peasants owned a third of all the communal land. Uh, nobles' land had been sold off with chief credit. There had been a whole series of good harvests and crop yields. So the downfall of the monarchy wasn't inevitable. When the First World War came along, it was initially popular. People thought this would unite the country. This gave them a, a common uh, uh, road along to march. But then there were all sorts of supply problems. It wasn't that the food and the kit didn't exist. It was the distribution system that didn't work. They couldn't get rations and supplies to, to where they should be. Um, they laid a telegraph line from uh, all the way from St. Petersburg to the front line. The soldiers chopped down the telegraph poles and used them as, uh, as, as firewood. And that was the sort of thing that was happening. And there were defeats. Um, in 1915, the Tsar sacks the army commander, takes over command himself. That was a big mistake because previously people could say it's the advisors. It's the bad advisors, not the Tsar himself. The Tsar now taking command himself, of course, uh, the buck stops, stops with him and he gets the blame. And it's becoming clearer and clearer that he's losing support. He's particularly losing support in the army. Um, and in March, 3rd of March 1917, he rang, telephoned all the army commanders and said, are you going to support me? And they said, terribly sorry, your Imperial Highness. No, we can't. So he abdicates uh, in favour initially of his brother, Michael. Uh, Michael realises that actually the monarchy's had it. Uh, he is the Tsar for one day and he uh, abdicates as well. And the country is now run by a provisional government, eventually uh, with the Prime Minister, a man called Kerensky. Now, Kerensky uh, was a socialist, but of relatively liberal ideas. And if um, Kerensky's government could have survived, then Russia might well have developed into a, into a democratic Western looking country. What did for Kerensky and the provisional government was trying to stay in the war. Kerensky felt that to come out of the war uh, would be letting down his allies, the British and the French. And he tried to stay in the war. Now, 
the Russian population were fed up with the war. They wanted out of the war. The army wanted out of the war. The Bolsheviks were able to, to capitalize on that. That's the extreme communist party. And we then have the November revolution. It's actually the October revolution because Russia was still on the, the old character, the own calendar. Uh, the provisional government is swept away. Kerensky actually escapes to, to America. Uh, and now we have the, the Russian civil war. And during the Russian Civil War, the Bolsheviks are not quite sure what to do with the Tsar and his family, and they move them around. Eventually, they move them out to Ekaterinburg, um, out of the way, they think. And then um, in the, uh, an organization called the Czech Legion, uh, who are fighting on the side of the white Russians, the anti-Bolsheviks, uh, managed to capture the uh, Trans-Siberian Railway, and they're getting closer and closer and closer to Ekaterinburg. And the Bolsheviks think that they're out to rescue the Tsar. Now, in fact, the Czech Legion probably didn't know the Tsar was in Ekaterinburg, and if they did know, they probably couldn't have cared less. Uh, but the result was that uh, the Tsar and the Tsarina and all his family uh, are shot uh, and, uh, and they're murdered. 17th of July, 1918. The brother, Michael, he's caught a bit later in November 1918. He's, he's shot as well. Now, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, there has been rehabilitation. The house that they were originally executed, murdered, assassinated, whatever you want to call it, in, uh, was knocked down. It was demolished in 1977 because the authorities were afraid it might become a place of, of pilgrimage. So now a, a church, it's the church on the blood for the holy royal martyrs has been built. And when we get to Ekaterinburg, uh, we shall be visiting it. On the ground floor, it is a church. It's a Russian Orthodox church. Uh, and on the first floor, it's a, it's a museum uh, to, to the Romanovs. So that is the Romanovs. Uh, Alexander III, who was the last really strong uh, czar, he said that Russia is too diverse and too primitive for Western democracy. It's better to have a strong government and governments rooted in faith and tradition. And perhaps that's what we're saying uh, going back to uh, in Russia today. Thank you very much for listening.